Hi y'all, this is going to be the first video of at least two videos dealing with the subject of the sexual abuse of adult heterosexual males. Um, and I say at least two because I might get a little long-winded and the intro video here might span into three. Uh, I don't know, but in addition to that, there may be future instances of this in which I'll do follow-up videos on uh, more stuff I'm working on. Uh, and we shall see where that goes. But uh, I'm going to talk about four cases in the first two videos. Uh, broken down by subject matter. One deals with medical fetish, uh, stuff that is portrayed as medical fetish pornography, but is not actual pornography. I mean, it's the graphic representation of sexual activity, so in that sense it's porn. Uh, but it's not, um, they're not actors. The men in these videos are actual people being sexually abused. It is distributed as being pornography, and it is not. So a lot of people watch these materials thinking it's a, a sexual fetish video for medical exams, and what they're actually watching are real-life men, real-life being abused by uh, some terrible people. So, um, in that way, uh, you know, straight guys have been great to me over the years. Uh, they're not much uh, thought about on, um, well, many things. Men are the overwhelming victims of most every type of crime. Uh, despite that, everyone's hyper-concerned with women being the uh, victims of crimes, even though men, depending on the type of crime, two to three times uh, more prevalent as the victim population and they get short shrift a lot. And in female offenders, by the way, uh, tend, to get the, uh, tend to get much shorter sentences for such abuses as they inflict on uh, men or on, on children. So uh, this is just something in that way. Um, there's a little bit of background on me for those who are new. I used to be a, a cop, a federal investigator. Uh, I'm going to use investigator as a generic term. It could, be, you could refer to a detective, inspector, an agent, whatever it is, just a criminal investigator. And part of, of cultivating the skill, the mindset of working in law enforcement, is to realize um, activities that look like they're perfectly normal if taken in isolation. Like if you just look at this narrow thing and fail to take into account some broader picture, you will overlook crimes that are happening right before your eyes. Or uh, you will overlook things that which should be looked into and which, if looked into, if, if you scratch beneath the surface just a little bit, uh, you go from something that, that could, you know, looks perfectly normal at some you know, level of focus to something that, you know, oh, this is a substantial case that needs to be looked into. And uh, that, you know, that happens a lot in the patrol division when they see people out, you know, hand-to-hand -hand transactions and whatnot. Um, in, you, get, you just get an eye for that kind of thing. Uh, but on the investigative side of the house instead of the patrol division side of the house, whether state or federal, uh, much of your work is not generated by yourself. It's referred to you. It comes from a patrol division. A local PD will call the feds. Uh, you get tips, um, you know, being a part of, a part of being a good investigator is networking in the community, uh, handing out your card to business owners, you, know, you love everybody's coffee at the coffee shop, even if it tastes like ass, uh, that, that, you know, that steak you ordered medium rare that showed up, you charcoal through and through, is the best tasting steak that has ever been staked in the history of steak. You love it. Uh, you don't hate anybody's anything that they produce because you want these people to call you if they see something. And there are many more of them out there in the world than there are cops, so it's, a, it's, a good, uh, it's good to know these people. You can develop sources that way, along with other te techniques too. But anyway, <clears throat> um, much of your caseload is not self-started. You pick it up because it's referred to you, and then the, uh, another significant portion of your workload is stuff that you find while you're investigating one thing. You think you're working on one type of case, and then you quickly realize that there's evidence here of something much more substantial and occasionally even you know, a monster case. And you can get this from normal patrol division uh, interaction too. And uh, when I was studying um, you know, to be a, a criminal investigator, we studied a lot of cases and how they were caught, how they were broken open by the attention to detail of you know, just regular investigators, regular cops out there just paying attention. Uh, the details matter. And some of the cases we studied were ones where you have a particular, uh, you will get, usually get a large geographic region, like at the federal level you get a field office that will have resident agencies that cover a smaller geographic region within the field office. And within both the field office and the resident agency, usually not always, but often I'll say, uh, you get um, divisions or sections or detachments or branches, lots of different names. Uh, and you get this also at the state, uh, you know, local police department, sheriff's office, state police, whatever. Uh, that what you work on are subject matter specific. Like you might, uh, it could be a uh, organized crime, it could be you know gang interruption, it could be drugs, it could be fraud, uh, computer crime. I mean, it could be any anything. It'll be a subject matter area though. Now, 
agencies in the federal government usually work on subject uh, matter stuff anyway. So there's anyway, um, there's a little bit of redundancy in that, but I'll put that off to this. You'll have like a mandate where you might have like 15 different ty kinds of things that are assigned to your agency. But within that, you know, this section will do three or four types, this section will do four or five types, whatever it is. You, something along those lines. But nevertheless, um, you know, any federal officer, or virtually any federal agent, federal officer can arrest for any um, you know, violation of federal law that happens in their presence. Uh, you know, they have the legal power to do an investigation, even if it's not, um, you know, their agency's bailiwick. You know, the court's not going to be, oh, I'm sorry, we don't take rape cases from the Secret Service. <laughs> You've got to go to somebody else. You know that just doesn't happen. If it's filed and gets to the grand jury and the prosecutor picks it up and goes, that's how it goes. And so we studied cases like that. Um, now the attention to detail bit, a great example of outstanding and excellent attention to detail in law enforcement is how the serial killers Leonard Lake and Charles Ng were captured. It, it started off with a very minor call about a stolen hammer from an Ace hardware shoplifting kind of case, you know, three buck case, and the uh, officer on scene just being diligent and not, you know, pencil whipping it because it's a minor case, looks at the ID, notices that there's an oddity with it, uh, keeps scratching beneath the surface, finds a firearm with a silencer, and, you know, through just this continued scratching beneath the surface of the new thing that has been presented to him, uh, they find a farm of bodies. These are very prolific serial killers, and it's a pair of them. Uh, Leonard Lake kills himself with a cyanide capsule that he had sewn into his garments in the interview room. Uh, so, he's dead which gives a convenient scapegoat for the other partner in the crime. Whatever they might try to pin on me, I can say, it was him. I had no knowledge of any of this. That's horrible. I would never, never participate in that kind of activity. That's just dreadful. And, you know, the dead guy's not going to contest it. So you know, you've got a, a, a very convenient excuse that's built in, particularly when there's no direct evidence that linked Charles Ng to any of the murders, until there was. And it was discovered by a deputy sheriff who was watching a video. Um, they were seizing materials from the house. And, uh, you know, he was just, well, let's see what's on it. You don't know what's there until you look. And who knows? So he, whatever tape is in there, he puts it on. And they had tried to record over it. And they had been successful in the, whole, in the video of recording over what had previously been depicted in, in the material. Except for one frame. That's what got this guy 11 death sentences. There was one frame that had you know, one picture, uh, one still image that depicted uh, one of the murder victims wrapped inside a, not a blanket, but a sleeping bag on top of, I think, a wheel, wheelbarrow, which is what they used to transport the now dead person uh, to the place where they disposed of the bodies, and the person was in rigor mortis. So this photo was taken with, you know, you couldn't say that, oh, well, this is just, it could have been anything in that sleeping bag, you know, it's a body in rigor mortis. Uh, which they were able to show through other means. And uh, 11 death sentences is what Charles Ng got uh, for his troubles of uh, failing to be able to record over the documentation of his crimes. And on that point, um, to the criminal element out there, particularly ones who want to do serious crimes, rape, murder, burglary, uh, homicide, thing, you know, the, the, the big ones. Uh, one, don't do it. Okay, just stop. Two, if you are going to ignore one, by all means, please get out your video camera and uh, make a detailed memorialization of your criminal activities and distribute it uh, wide, as widely as possible, please. Uh, law enforcement, I speak, I speak on behalf of all law enforcement everywhere when I say we greatly appreciate it. It makes our jobs so much the easier. You see in police dramas all the time that what the detectives are after is they want to get a confession. And it's not true. That's not, that is not the holy grail of an interview. Uh, if, if, I, if you're ever sitting across from me in an interview room, uh, I don't really care what you admit to, because juries are a little bit suspicious about people who make uh, inculpatory statements to the law and to law enforcement, because there's always the well, you know, it's a course of environment, uh, display of authority. Maybe the person was just saying it to get them to shut up. I mean, so that's always a question in the jury box, uh, and it's certainly something that a defense counsel uh, can raise. And you know, juries can be suspicious of, of, you know, well, that confession looks really good, a little too good. What juries don't doubt. Uh, and this is, this is the holy grail of an interview, is false exculpatory claims. A person lying to the police um, about, you know, in, in ways that say, that show, oh, I'm the best thing that's ever existed, best thing since sliced bread, I would never do this. That's the holy grail of an interview. You want false exculpatory statements. 
Because a false statement that you give under a course of environment to get the police to stop, now that's one thing. I mean, you, you, sure, the, it, the person has told a falsehood, but the jury will read, can easily believe that that's not a credibility problem, that's a fear problem. But when you are spinning out all these lines about, I was somewhere else when it happened, or I wasn't there, and then they can show that you were here, your credibility is shot. I'm sorry, that jury is not going to you know, believe much of what you have to say, and your defense counsel is going to you know, have a, a real road to hoe if, if, uh, if that has happened. Slightly better than that, though, is things that don't involve law enforcement contact at all. And that, that involves the materials produced by the criminals. The notes that you take, uh, you know, oh, here's my plan for what I'm going to do, or here's you know, some ledger of what I got in the robbery or the burglary, burglary or whatever it is. Uh, here are my aliases, all my fake IDs, whatever, you know, uh, that kind of thing. Videographic, audio uh, recordings of what you have done in your own voice, taken by your own hand, of your own volition while you committed the crime. That's the holy grail. That right there is, I, I, every criminal should carry around cameras. You, one, don't be a criminal. Two, uh, get a camera if you're going to be one. Greatly appreciate it. Thanks. Uh, juries will appreciate it, too. They will reward you. <laughs> I, I, I promise you, juries or judges, whoever the trier of fact is, they will listen very, very carefully to everything you said on the tape. And uh, they will give you something in return accordingly. I, uh, I have it on really good authority that this happens regularly. So, uh, in any event, I talked about the Charles Ng and whatnot. Uh, but sometimes, when you're investigating matters, uh, you get a monster case through, you know, just, it, not, they have nothing in common except that the same person has committed both types of crimes, and one of them might not be in your bailiwick. Uh, but when you try to give it to a person whose you know, area this is, and they don't take it, what do you do then? Do you say, oh, well, you know, the FBI wouldn't take over the serial killer case, so we'll just you know, stick it over here and get back and go do something else. This is a Secret Service case involving a guy named James DeBartolaben, who was doing counterfeiting stuff, which is not a trivial offense, but, you know, it's, it's not murder. It's not rape. It's not torture. It's not kidnapping. Although he did all that, too. And this was uh, discovered by, you know, the, the, this man had uh, lots and lots and lots of materials, lots of documents, his plans, receipts. I mean, this guy was meticulous about helping law enforcement convict him for all of his counterfeiting activities. Uh, he also made a lot of uh, audio and visual recordings of some of his deeds. And the investigators, the Secret Service agents, decided that they would watch some of these videos or listen to some of the audio, look at some of the photo I'm sorry, look at some of the photographs, listen to the audio, whatever. And so they start playing an audio tape. Maybe he has a co-conspirator he's talking about, organizing this plan with. Wouldn't that be great? And they play the tape, and lo and behold on it is a woman screaming and screaming and begging to be killed which changes everything. Oh, this is an entirely new uh, investigation. So they go through these materials and they're a lot of it. They take it to the FBI who has experience with you know, this kind of thing. This is, in the, this is in 1983. By statute, the FBI did not have in their mandate anywhere the assisting with serial killers, even though they did a lot of it. It was a bit spotty whether or not they would get involved if requested. They decided in this case, well, you don't know who any of the uh, ostensible victims are. Uh, it's perfectly legal for a person to have a tape of someone screaming to be murdered. I mean, it could be anything. We're not, we're not going to look into it. We don't care. We're not interested. Take it, shove it, get out of here. Shoot, we've got more important things to do with our lives. So the Secret Service is okay. You know, dutifully rebuked and kicked out like the red-headed stepchild. Uh, they leave. They go back to their office, take it to their director. The director listens to it and says, spend the money, work this case, figure out who these women are and what the circumstances are that gave rise to this. Uh, every agency has not only the power to decide whether or not a case falls within its jurisdiction, has the, the obligation. Uh, you, you know, you have to work it at least long enough to find out whether or not it happened in your jurisdiction and is a crime for which, you know, your sovereign has power to prosecute. Uh, and if, you're so if, if not, then you hand it off to whoever would be the appropriate agency. So they compiled all this man's receipts and they tracked his, his comings and goings that he had meticulously documented over the years. Uh, and they went jurisdiction to jurisdiction to jurisdiction with their various materials, do, you know, talking to these people. I'm, I'm sure they made thousands of phone calls running this down. And uh, uh, anyway, in the fullness of the investigation, there were some uh, photographic materials that depicted him with a hood on or a mask, and then there were some that depicted him and, and a woman without the mask on. And the materials that depicted him and a woman where he was wearing a mask they were able to find living women. 
and the materials that depicted him without the mask, aka when the women had seen his face, they were unable to find any living women. Uh, he's believed to have killed eight people. Now, they, uh, the feds, got him for uh, the counterfeiting and some rape stuff. Uh, they, they did the work, got those prosecutions pushed in, and he got, in total, uh, nearly 400 years in jail. And therefore, not a single local jurisdiction would prosecute the murders. Um, because, well, he's going to be in jail for life. He's never getting out. What does it matter? Well, it matters to the families who would like to have their day in court uh, and to hear the man you know, in open court either confess to doing it or to have a jury convict him for doing what, he, what everyone knows that he did. It is a measure of closure for the families. Uh, 30, 40 years ago, that was not a concern of law enforcement. I'm happy to say that that is a concern of prosecutors and law enforcement today. Uh, that, that is an improvement in the criminal justice system. But it's the attention to detail and a general level of competence uh, at working cases, even when you know your only training in that kind of thing would have been at an academy. You, know, you got in part of your criminal investigation training and then you never touch it again. The Secret Service, not experts at murder or rape, use their Secret Service abilities, their, their, their documentary evidence, to narrow down where this guy could and couldn't have been. And they were looking at all the missing women and all murders. Uh, really excellent work on their part. Um, they they really managed to find out you know, this guy's history. Pardon my dog, she's sick and the medicine's not working as well as it used to, which is unfortunate. And she's getting pretty old. But anyway, um, and he would go around, uh, he was killing real estate agent women. He, uh, just a serial killer, just a terrible, terrible guy. His name was uh, jo uh, James DeBartelaben. <coughs> um, so you have to pay attention to detail and you have to have that general level of competence to be able to solve things that are outside of what it is you primarily work on when the people who should be working on it have decided to phone it in that day, who've decided, I can't be bothered with this matter. Uh, you can't just let that matter lie. Someone has to do the work. Someone has to look at all those materials frame by frame. Someone has to listen to the, the sounds of these women being tortured uh, and then some of them being killed. You. It is simply not proper for law enforcement agents, the, the analysts, or the prosecutors, uh, or defense counsel for that matter, to avoid listening to or watching these materials, despite the fact that it will have this huge emotional impact on you, that is not a sufficient reason to abdicate your duty. Uh, you must, you must, you must carry out the investigation. And I know uh, anyone who's worked in law enforcement will know officers who have killed themselves from you know just the, the tonnage of emotional baggage that you get. Uh, one of the cases that I studied when I was going, when I was studying uh, traffic homicide investigator, uh, you've got to have your Bible for that, by the way, you know, J. Standard Baker. Um, and then, you know, one of my other Bibles is Fundamentals of Criminal Investigation. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, in one of the classes on the, the traffic thing, when I was at the local level, uh, there was a guy who, in, there was a fatal crash in on the East Coast, it was one of the worst uh, most dead, it was one of the deadliest in U.S. history. And in it, um, everyone who was involved in the accident, which was caused by a guy named Mahoney, was driving drunk and hit a bus head-on and it was full of uh, teenagers and middle school children, teenage, uh, high school students and middle, uh, middle school students. It was a church bus. Everyone, everyone, everyone survived the crash. But 24 of the children and three of the adults burned in, in a fire. And that's what killed them. They, they couldn't get out because... In, uh, the exit was blocked by something that had slid around and no one could get it open. They couldn't kick out the windows. Uh, and 20, you know, 24 children and three adults uh, were burned to death. And he worked that case, one of the investigators, one of the lead investigators worked that case for months and months and months, at the end of which, when he completed it, he wound up getting one of those I Love Me jackets, uh, the state home for the mentally bewildered, because it, it just destroyed him emotionally. Uh, and he had to have a lot of therapy. It, it's a really burdensome job, but it's not an acceptable reason that it's going to be emotionally difficult or psychologically traumatizing. Uh, that's not a sufficient reason to avoid looking at the materials, whatever they happen to depict. And believe you me, uh, you will, if you work in any investigations for any amount of time, you will come across materials that you will see that will, uh, you, you will get that clammy feeling. You can feel your parotid gland swelling up. Uh, because you want to vomit, you can feel your stomach churn. I mean, some of it is just absolutely terrible. Um, so don't ask cops, by the way, this is an aside, 
what's the the you know the goriest thing you've ever seen because they can't talk about it without thinking about what it is they've seen and those that stuff is not pleasant also don't ask them have you killed and have you killed anybody and especially don't ask them have you gotten to kill anybody like it's some privilege uh, if they have been involved in a deadly force situation they don't want to go the rest of their lives having to constantly remember having taken a human life uh, so you know don't do that Word to the wise anywho <clears throat> On to our instant, uh, well, coming up to our instant cases. In the general population, at least from what I know of it, and I haven't done any extensive study on this, but people don't tend to have uh, fetishes that stack. So uh, pornographers who are incompetent at everything they do um, don't seem to realize this. Like uh, I've watched some where the guy doing the recording, the director dude, will you know, give the person a once over and then zoom in on their feet and say, well, you know, some of our members like to watch feet. Well, some of your members probably like to watch bestiality, too, but you don't throw that in because some of them might like it. And the reason for it is that once you've seen that thing that's in there, it can't be unseen, and there are more people who are turned off by that than who are turned on by it. So you have three categories of people, those for whom it's a neutral act, those for whom it's sexually exciting, and those for whom it's absolutely disgusting. The sexually exciting bit's going to be really small. The neutral, which means you're wasting your time because it's not doing anything for them, uh, and the that's disgusting group are going to be the predominant group and those are who you're showing it you know that's where your money is not not the unless you're really going for a really niche of a niche of a niche audience yeah uh, you know, watching people shit on each other some people are into that I guess you just throw that in too because hey why not and they wonder why they go out of business anyway uh, no one who works in pornography and I've watched a lot of it is competent at anything they do the, the rule is take something that is extraordinarily fun to participate in uh, that's rule one. Rule two, tartify it every possible way. Three, have the people who are doing the retartified version of it pretend like what they're doing is number one. That's their, uh, their heuristic. And, you know, if there are 25,000 ways to do a scene, 24,999 of which are absolutely intelligent, non-retarded at all, and only one that's retarded, they each and every pornographer and porn actor will choose the retarded way to go every time, without exception. They, they are pathologically incompetent which is a context for looking at materials depicting sex acts. That's a context. Uh, another bit of information, and uh, this is in child porn cases a lot, is uh, forensic countermeasures. They will strip out the audio, uh, so that way you can't um, pick up details that can help track them down. Sometimes they do it because they don't want, uh, you know, it silences the screams of the children, and these are meant to be distributed and they don't want that sound out there. Uh, you get that kind of stuff. Uh, and from my experience with working cases like this, the people who plan to keep the materials are likelier to keep the sound in because they like it. The people who are making it to produce, to, you know, producing it to distribute it, or to produce to distribute a subset of it, are likelier to strip out the audio and engage in other forensic measures, countermeasures, which makes sense. I mean, if you're going to be distributing it, you want to do what you can to protect, you know, to keep from getting caught. I mean, it is, you know, illegal. <laughs> so anyway. Um, so I noticed uh, when I was when these sets of videos came to my attention that there were some of these uh, these things going on in the video, plus the context and you know just a lot of cases are you, you just look and something looks almost right but not quite, and in this case what looked right but not quite right was the fact that it actually looked normal. That was what caught my attention. It's certainly not materials that I would I would like. These are medical fetish videos. It's, you know, not my thing. Uh, so I I had known about the existence of these videos for a long time. hadn't really watched them, um, but I decided to click on the you know, recommended list. And I was like, oh, okay, fine, whatever. You're always suggesting the ship for whatever reason. So I click on it, and you know I skip around a little bit, and I notice that there's this guy on you know hospital bed, you know, one of the little examination tables, and he's in his he's you know, in his underwear, and as the doctor is doing the uh, is, is percussing him. And then he's, you know, auscultating him. I'm, I'm just paying attention to the doctor's movements because I know a good amount about medical science and health assessments. And so I'm watching, and uh, I notice the guy is unable to form a pleximeter, which is how you put your finger on the person's body uh, in order to do the percussion. And then the plexer, he does not doing that right. He's not hitting the distal interphalangeal joint. It just, you know, it's all over the place. So I'm like, okay, this is a guy who's not making you know, much effort. This is this is just porn. Side note, uh, I can't actually show you these videos 
But I can give you an example of the spectrum by using stuff that's perfectly legal. Uh, well, this is perfectly legal too, but perfectly within YouTube's terms of service and not at all related to pornography. And uh, they're ASMR videos, which stands for, I think, autonomous or automatic or something like that, sensory meridian response. Uh, and you get a lot of these medical checkup videos. Uh, if you don't know what ASMR is, it's a reaction people get to seeing, to watching other people do really tedious work, repetitive tedious work, or uh, an extreme something that requires an extreme amount of focus. Uh, it's a it's a very warm euphoric feeling. The first time I experienced it was when I was four years old and getting my hair cut. I remember, well, not quite four. I remember it quite distinctly because as it was the the clip of the scissors and the paste that the woman named Pauline was taking while she was cutting my hair. And the reason I was getting my hair cut by Pauline is because I had forsworn my mother's attempts due to the uh, previous year's curling iron incident involving my ear. Uh, so anyway, that's when I first noticed it. Uh, not everybody gets this. In fact, I think most people don't. And for some scientists, it's an open question whether it exists. All I can tell you is that to the extent that the phenomena, as described, is what we're talking about, uh, I experience it. So I'm, I'm totally uh, convinced that it exists because I've felt it. But in any event, you get a, a spectrum of competence in, in doing these kinds of videos. You have, on the one hand, the porn versions, I call them, because the setting is just the setting. I mean, it's just, you just state this is a medical exam, and then everything that you do has nothing to do with the medical exam. And you're like, oh, I have this little flashlight that clicks. I don't even have batteries in it, so the light is burned out or won't turn on, but I'm going to click it a lot because the clicking sound is, you know, the, the, uh, the click, 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 click is part of what, what is an ASMR trigger for certain people. So they do that, and I brought all these vials of random shit I found in my kitchen that I'm gonna, you know, have you smell, and, and uh, you know, I'm gonna touch you with, and anyway. So they're just, it's just a setting. The, the audience member has to do all the work of imagining that this would happen in any medical environment anywhere. Uh, here's a video about that if you wanna watch it. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you have the guys who, uh, when I watched this guy, I first thought, one of two things. He's either put a lot of time into studying just to do this video, or he actually has real training uh, because it is on point. It is perfect. Uh, you know, he talks about the you know, pre and post auricular lymph nodes, the, the, sur the superficial and the deep ones. The sternocleidomastoid is like, oh, I'm going from the insertion uh, down to the clavicle. The only thing that could have made it any possibly better at that point is if he said, I'm going from the insertion to the origin. But uh, I was like, mm hmm. Maybe, I don't know why he left that out. It would, in my, would have been, in my view, a better way to do it, but I wasn't doing it. He was doing it. Anyway, so uh, I just watched that whole section. I'll put a link to it here. Uh, he, you know, he was so good. I was like, you know, if, you'd, if you kept doing the fossa, the super uh, clivic ear fossa, I'm pretty sure that, like, if this guy in real life were feeling around, he would recognize, like, Virkov's node and Troy's ear sign if it were, if it were present. I mean, he would know. He, he was that good. And I went and watched and watched and watched and watched and watched and learned about him when I could. And actually, he's a nurse. So, ha! I was right. But then you have intermediate steps where they they do a pantomime of it, but it's uh, sufficiently good that if you don't know anything about medical science um, or you know health assessment, you'll look at it and go, oh, it's close enough, it looks real to me. Um, <clears throat> I'm not such a person. But anyway, so I'm watching this. Uh, this is the jock physical one. And I'm watching him, and then he touches, he, his hand rests on the guy's uh, junk, and the guy reacted, and it looked like to me a, you know, a passable, legitimate reaction. And I thought, well, you know, that's unusual because it's porn. They are pathologically incapable of, uh, of realistically representing anything. Um, so I decide to watch, you know, another one of these, his videos. Uh, all the way through, well, no, I can't say all the way through, I skipped around a little bit, but I decided to listen to the, uh, like, the health questionnaire part. And in one of them, uh, oh, I can't remember, one of the two guys asked the, the patient actor, uh, oh, did the nurse get your history? And he said, what nurse? And I'm like, you know, look, if you're going to do these for real, you can't, um, you got to be careful because the person who you're about to sexually abuse is not working off of your script. So, uh, just thought I'd point that out. Anyway, <clears throat> so, he's like, oh, I thought I thought she might have gotten it. And then he goes on to ask the questions. And these questions, I'm thinking, oh my god. Now, as I mentioned, in the real world of normal people, fetishes don't stack. But among criminals, this isn't true. Uh, sexual predators 
tend to have uh, a lot of overlapping and stacking fetishes so that if you find a rapist it's much more common that you're going to find someone who's into child pornography than people you know just someone chosen from the population at large because they have that one uh, deviant thing and then you know it just it is the the I don't want to say the, the gateway because that's such a cliche but these things tend to coincide and out of the four cases I'm going to talk about three of the four people perpetrators actually have a uh, are have are child molesters uh, or would be child molesters so it's interesting much much higher once you once you find a sexual predator you you should not be surprised that you will find they have a very wide taste uh, rather frequently and and what it is they're going to go after but anyway so uh, he asks the guy when he hit puberty, and uh, so I'm like, that's not you know, a question that comes up often. So I'm listening, and then he starts asking him, when did you first notice your body hair? When did it come in and what order? Uh, when was your first wet dream? When was your last wet dream? Have you ever had a physical with your parents in attendance? I mean, this guy's like really focused on the adolescent years, and so I start paying attention, you know, looking around his little uh, room, and I noticed that on a table, there is an, uh, an orchidometer there, which is used uh, for tanner staging, which is how puberty is staged. And it has uh, preformed representations of testes uh, that you can use size-wise, and you scroll through until you get what matches here, matches the testes of the person. Uh, and then from that, you, you can make some estimates about their tanner staging. And it goes from you know, all, very young all the way up to adult. And you know that is not... Um, a normal contraption, a normal device to have. You you will see a sphygma manometer, like an ophthalmoscope, uh, you know, steth uh, stethoscope, things like that. You know, not unusual in medical fetish videos, you know, speculum things like that. But an orchidometer was really weird. So this man has now uh, earned him himself uh, my full undivided attention. I'm going to watch all of his videos. Uh, that I can I can get start to finish listen to every single word, so I did, and I organized them uh, by a rough time frame, and in the early videos the guys would masturbate themselves to provide a sperm sample, and in the later videos he's doing it, and then later videos yet he's not only doing it but he's in, he's introducing uh, other materials like for sounding is when you stick a tube down a person's penis hole. Um, uh, he it's not just an anal exam now he's got specula he's got various contraptions and devices he's inserting into these guys when he is badly masturbating them there will be a sudden uh, when he's once he starts there will be a sudden cut in some of the cases and they come back and the guy's finishing himself off and I'm like bad ed bad editing could explain that or that's the part of the conversation where the guy says whoa dude I don't know what the fuck you're on about but you need to stop that shit so <clears throat> That was the jock physical guy. And then there was the male physical guy. And the first video of his I saw, I, I'm watching it, and he's obviously not trained, uh, but then it occurred to me, he's done his homework. He's got his pleximeter right, which is how the finger goes across the body when you're going to do percussion. He's getting in interspaces, but he doesn't follow the right pattern on the ladder. Uh, you know, if, if, so if you're looking at like the lung fields in the back and you want to do percussion, you'll pick either the left or the right side to start with. And what you're trying to compare is the symmetry you know does this does this lung field sound like this lung field so you go left right and then you can either drop down and go left right or you can go left right drop down and go right left drop down left right drop down right left or you can go left right left right left right uh, when you're doing that you never ever go twice in a row down the same side uh, <clears throat> because you want to directly compare this thunk to that thunk and he was missing that and he didn't get the CVA tenderness area right, the uh, the, um, the costal vertebral um, angle tenderness. He misses that. <clears throat> He's supposed to like you. He should be taking uh, <clears throat> checking for sacral edema. He misses that. He pushes on on like the love handles. I mean, just it. But it is a good pantomime if you don't know what the guy is looking for. When he he doesn't know. Uh, I'm going to make some detail here because one of the questions that that I'm sure a lot of you have thought are how can you not know that this is happening. I will link some, some experiments below where when people think that the person with whom they're dealing is an authority figure like that they are what they purport to be, uh, people are much more inclined to go along with what they're doing even if it violates their own moral code or their own standards and they think well you know 
the guy's a, a doctor. I mean, he wouldn't do something that's illegal. Doctors don't do that. And I've seen a lot of these comments uh, following down uh, these two cases where guys would say, oh, this could never happen to me. This is hubris. Unless you know, like, all the words I've used, it can happen to you. If, unless you know precisely what it is they're looking for when they do percussion, unless you know what resonance sounds like, what timpani sounds like, what dullness, what flatness sound like, uh, you know, when, when he's doing uh, percussion you know, for the, uh, the spleen area, he's, he's coming across the abdomen, goes up, he, and he, he should be getting timpani over, uh, over the stomach area, the gastric bubble, um, but he doesn't. He gets, he gets uh, uh, dullness. That could be a bad finger placement or whatever it is. What should have happened at that, at that moment um, is he should, there should have been a question to the patient because it indicates one of three things. Uh, it could be some kind of spleen enlargement. It could be pleural effusion or the person recently ate. There should be a question about why am I not hearing timpani where I should hear timpani. Same thing when you're, when you're percussing down you know, the midclavicular, midaxillary, or the midscapular line. Uh, you want 579, which are the number of ribs down you want to go before you expect to get a change from timpani to dullness, and then down in this area you'll get uh, different sounds. Um, and that's because of where the liver is on the front and where the diaphragm is on the back, and you want to know about uh, a lot of stuff. And so if you're substantially, if you're above the fifth rib for the midclavicular line and you're getting not timpani, uh, you need to be paying attention to that because it could indicate a liver enlargement or if you're in the back you have some diaphragmat Diaphragmat diaphragmatic uh, problems or, or something else. Um, so you, the, you need to look at the excursion of the diaphragm, you got to test for that. It's a lot that goes on back there. And if these things, if you don't know what you should be feeling on your back when you're getting an exam or the order in which the doctor is percussing you or auscultating for lung sounds or uh, cardiac sounds and, and you realize that you know he's not going here, here, uh, here, here, and here. Well, I guess you can't see that. It's a, uh, you know, uh, make sure I get on the right side here. Uh, yes, uh, aortic pulmonic. Uh, this is called herbs point, or the second pulmonic, and then you get down to the uh, tricuspid valve, and then the mitral valve, which is over the apical pulse. Uh, again, fifth rib down, and then fourth, third, uh, and second intercostal margins on either side of the angle of Louis. These are important things, landmarks that. Uh, if, if you know what they are, you can spot immediately whether or not the doctor's positioning is off. And when he says he's checking for the heart sounds and he's, he's right there on the sternal margin, uh, you know, uh, aortic and pulmonic, those are heart sounds, not lung sounds you're looking for. I mean, the guy doesn't know what he's doing, but if you don't know what he should be doing, it looks real enough. And that's, that was convincing to these guys who were, in fact, uh, many of them were homeless guys that he had paid uh, 50 or so dollars to to come in for prostate research for uh, the local university with which he was a doctor. Um, he was so convincing that he managed to get a father and son team and I don't know how he managed this because there was a cut and edit where the conversation happened but the father wound up masturbating his own son, adults both. Uh, for real, this isn't pretend, he's real father, real son. Um, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm watching this and I, I realize this guy is doing a very legitimate pantomime and I'm listening to the questions that people are asking, and they're, you know, at, they have what seem to me to be reasonable questions. And there's some goofy shit in there, too, that was, like, confounding me. I'm like, well, he's got that goofy shit in there. How would anybody go for this? I'm like, well, you know, these people, they never studied a health assessment. What do they know? And, you know, plus, plus certain psychological dispositions. So I watch all of this guy's videos. And so now I've watched hundreds of videos of heterosexual men being sexually abused by people who are pretending to be doctors uh, and recording it and then selling it as pornography. And uh, so I'm like, that's what I think is happening. I need to track these people down and find out who they are. Now, of all the four cases I, I, uh, I'm going to talk about in these two videos, three of them, uh, before I started, had already been solved and people have, have already been dealt with. The fourth one hadn't been dealt with. He had, he was just arraigned uh, in federal court. So we'll talk. That's one of the videos in, uh, in the next one, though, so that's not relevant here. Now, so the one guy that did the male physical videos called himself Dr. Dean, Dean Willoughby or Willisby. I don't know how to pronounce his name. And the other guy's name was Mike Castine, Castine, Cast something. Um, <clears throat> 
And one of the videos that I watched of the Michael guy, the one that caught my eye of this looks like a legitimate, you know, oh my god, I really can't believe this guy just grabbed my junk and is now fondling me. And in some of the others he put the patient's, patient's hand down his uh, doctor outfit, his, his scrubs. And you could see in every one of those cases that these guys were not, either they were on the script because, and they were really good actors, or there wasn't a script and these were real events and the guys are just startled. Uh, the one that I had originally watched, just by happenstance, it turns out to have murdered the guy for the sexual abuse. So, uh, real shit, not, not fake at all. Um, now, as, uh, there was some audio work and more in the other videos than these, but there were also some, uh, some videos that were legitimate porn, like you could, they were working off of a script and it looked just like porn. It was absolutely retarded, the fake moan, I mean, so he'd slip in some real stuff along with, uh, I'm sorry, some actual porn, you know, the fake stuff along with the real stuff. So, uh, there was that kind of masking, a little bit of masking work done there. But he was, in fact, um, recruiting these people uh, who were variously coming into for heterosexual porn. And this was supposed to be the doctor who was going to do their physical to make sure they could do the porn. And because it was a physical for sexual activity, uh, the guys had understood that there would be, it would be more extensive than a normal physical like you would get to go play football. And that's why they would go along with the anal probing uh, and the different devices. Uh, and then, like, and some of them, when you listen to the content, uh, he would be checking their size, because the women need to know that. <laughs> and uh, so while he's getting them started, they would get excited, and you know, here he is, and he's got his little measuring devices, and he measures this way, and measures that way, and measures the other, you know major axis, the minor axis. I mean, he's really, you know, just playing with their dicks. But he's got a lot of things to help him play with their dicks while he's doing it. And so the guys are sitting here and they're like, you know, one of those out of broad experiences, like, well, I see this is happening to me, but that's not, this can't be me. How's, what's, what is happening in my life? You know, what, what's going on here? And then, you know, one of the guys gets excited uh, because, you know, all this work. Anyway, he gets close to ejaculating and he grabs the doctor's hand the you know the doctor and the doctor pushes him back and you know makes him go and the dude is like he's having an orgasm but he's also pissed off <laughs> and uh so i was reading through some of um the background in this guy and just you know not not a good dude he should never have been producing pornography in the first place because he is a convicted child rapist. He was convicted of uh, raping a very young child in the 1980s, but because of uh, some technicality or what he fell through the cracks and uh, wasn't re he didn't have to register as a sex offender, even though he should, you know, still thereby not have been able to produce pornography and to get, you know, all the licenses. Uh, the other guy is in prison now for impersonating, uh, for performing medical pra uh, procedures without a license. Um, I don't know what would have happened to the guy who got murdered, whether or not it would have been unlawful of sexual activity that he engaged in with these gentlemen. Um, it, may, it may not actually be illegal because the, in, in some, particularly in the other two videos I'm going to talk about, the men did consent to engage in sexual activity. Just the consent was procured under uh, fraud. And that's not necessarily illegal uh, in, in, you know, depending on where you live. So. There are difficulties. You, it, it's actually legally possible to molest men in this way in some states without penalty. Uh, and if you don't record it, then you will be able to get away with it, assuming they don't exact retribution against you. But uh, under the law, you'll be able to get away with it. Um, so the reason that Dr. Dean went to jail is not because of the sexual abuse of these men, homeless men who you know, were paid, uh, some, sometimes college students. Uh, the, I mentioned the father-son incident. Uh, he impersonated a, a doctor working for a university. He had you know, letterhead cards, you know, the whole, he, and tens of, you know, I mean, thousands and thousands of dollars he's put into building his office like a doctor's office. He had everything in there. I mean, it was very convincing. You look at it, like everything that you see in your doctor's office, he had. He has put some serious work into, uh, in, into this. He uh, was not, uh, so far as I know, so far as been yet determined, not into kids. 
So there's no instant, no uh, allegation of any child molestation, no history of it, no child porn or anything like that. But it wouldn't surprise me if it turned up because, you know, there's a good correspondence between sexual predators and sexual predators of younger folks. So anyway, um, that, was, that was going on. And what he gets nailed for is the impersonating a doctor and, you know, the practice of medicine without a license. And he gets many, many years for it. Uh, apparently, he nearly collapsed when the judge maxed him out uh, on, on the sentence. Now, when I was watching his videos, in addition to seeing how realistic it was, one of the things that really got me was like, my, my God, is he was actually, you know, they had this portion at the end of the video where he would give the men injections. He was actually injecting them with shit. And, it, it, and he would make up a different thing and each, you know, this is a clindamycin, this is penicillin, this is a tetanus shot, this is whatever. You know, words he's read off of WebMD or whatever happened, whatever it was. And then, so these guys would, you know, all right, here's my butt cheek, you know, give me the injection. And, and so I'm watching, he pulls an needle out, and then blood follows. And I'm like, that's not a prop. That's, these guys are really, ble he's giving them real injection. What the hell is he sticking in these guys? Um, you know, uh, a lot of people, as I mentioned, think that this kind of stuff just can't happen to them. They're, they're, they're too savvy. Let me just tell you this. No one goes into their doctor's office and verifies the credentials. You have not walked into your doctor's office, taken his license number off the thing, and called the state to make sure he's licensed. You don't do it for the nurses. Most people aren't checking the vials that the nurses are extracting drugs from, you know, the, withdrawing the drugs from in the syringe to give to you. I do incidentally check that because of an incident that happened to me. I, no one injects me with anything without my permission. Without, It's not a sufficient re, uh, explanation if I ask them what is that. And they say, oh, it's something to help with this. I didn't ask you what it's supposed to do. I asked you what its name is. Show me the vial. Now, of course, at that point, I'm still taking it on faith that what is in the vial is what's on the label, which may or may not be true. So, uh, if you think that you're too savvy or you can't get sucked into something like this, unless you know a lot about medicine, you are fooling yourself. Uh, and you're fooling yourself if you think you have the independence of mind to, in all these kinds of cases I'm going to talk about and many others, to just be this you know, little island under yourself, uninfluenced by your psychological predisposition, predispositions that we all have because you're so superior and such an individual, you are at high risk because you have deluded yourself into thinking that you are special among men. You are special among women. The psychological uh, problems that bedevil the rest of us don't apply to you because you're super and special. Don't think that. It is a good way to be taken for a fool. Alright, so that's this video. The next one will be on the other topic, and the housewives. All right, have a great day.